No matter how careful you are when transporting or handling hazardous materials, some scenarios, like an accident on a major highway, can be out of your control. Let's say a truck transporting hazardous materials flips over and is leaking onto the roadway and causes a fire. Emergency personnel arrive and need to know the type of hazardous material to put the fire out safely. If proper container labeling is missing from the truck, well, they may try to use water on the fire and instead of extinguishing it, it begins to spread. This would be extremely unsafe for everyone involved in the accident. Proper labeling of containers and transport vehicles would have prevented this situation from getting worse. If the truck was labeled with the required ID numbers 33 and 1203, emergency personnel would have known that the truck contained a highly flammable liquid like gasoline. Having this knowledge would have allowed them to reference the necessary emergency response guide, clear the area, and put out the fire safely. Labeling hazardous materials correctly can prevent injuries and save lives. In this course, we'll be discussing the nine DOT hazard classes and their subdivisions and some common examples of each. The responsibilities of the shipper and carrier of hazardous materials. What placarding and ID numbers are, their location, and the role they play in container labeling. How to properly store various hazardous materials, including flammable liquids, liquefied petroleum gases, LPGs, and anhydrous ammonia. Prior to discussing what transport labels look like and where they're placed, it's first important to understand what they represent. DOT has nine classes that all hazardous materials are categorized into based on their chemical properties. Most classes have subcategories or divisions to provide more details on the hazards. This class involves explosives with a maximum detonating hazard, a flammable hazard, or combination of the two. Blasting agents, which are materials consisting of a fuel and oxidizer intended for blasting, are also within this class. Some common examples of hazard class 1 include nitroglycerin, fireworks, TNT or dynamite, and ammunition. This class includes compressed gases, gases that were dissolved under pressure, as well as liquefied gases. These gases may or may not be flammable and can be poisonous or toxic. Some common examples of hazard class 2 include compressed hydrogen or oxygen, acetylene, sulfur tetrafluoride, and ethylene. This class includes materials with a flashpoint no greater than 141 degrees Fahrenheit and combustible liquids, substances with a flashpoint between 141 and 200 degrees Fahrenheit. OSHA defines a flashpoint as the maximum temperature where a liquid gives off a vapor that could form an ignitable mixture with air. Some common examples of hazard class 3 include gasoline, paint, kerosene, and diesel fuel. This class includes all solid materials that pose a serious risk of fire and are separated into categories based on if they can cause a fire, spontaneously create heat, or create a flammable gas when exposed to water. Some common examples of hazard class 4 include magnesium, white phosphorus, calcium carbide, and all alkali metals. This class includes materials that can create a fire or keep on burning through an oxidation reaction. The peroxides in this category contain everything needed to start a fire on their own. Some common examples of hazard class 5 include potassium permanganate, ammonium nitrate used for fertilizing, and hydrogen peroxide. This class includes liquids and solids that are considered toxic enough to humans to cause a hazard to their health if exposed to the material. It also includes materials that have a pathogen that can cause disease in humans. Some common examples of hazard class 6 include some pesticides, cyanides, lead, and organic compounds including phenols and cresols. This class includes any material that is unstable, can undergo radioactive decay, and emit radiation. Some common examples of hazard class 7 include uranium, tritium, which is used in emergency exits and other signs, and medical radioactive tracers like iodine. This class includes all substances that have the ability to corrode. OSHA defines a corrosive as any material that causes destruction to living tissue chemically at the site of contact. Some common examples of hazard class 8 include hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide, or lye. 
This class includes all other hazardous materials that don't fit into the other eight classes. These materials may be an environmental hazard or marine pollutant. Some common examples of hazard class nine include dry ice, formaldehyde, and different types of batteries, including fuel cells, lithium, and nickel. So now that we've discussed the nine major hazard classes and run through some common examples, you're now ready to learn more specifics on the transportation of these materials. Transportation is regulated by the Hazardous Materials Transportation Act, or HMTA, which applies to the transportation of these materials to any state or country via any vessel, including rail cars, aircraft, and motor vehicles. This act requires that proper communication, including labeling and packaging, is done during shipment. Both the shipper and the carrier of hazardous materials share the responsibility of making sure all hazardous materials and packages are labeled correctly. This involves the individual container labeling as well as the proper labels on the outside of the transport vehicle. A placard is a sign for public display on a package or vehicle to warn people of the presence of a hazard. A placard is one of the most important shared responsibilities of both the shipper and the carrier of hazardous materials. The DOT HAZCOM symbols on the transport vehicles and the GHS pictograms used for labeling individual bottles and containers are not 100% identical, but they're similar enough that they communicate the same information. There are several regulations when it comes to the type and placement of placards, so let's dive into them together. Placards are almost always required when transporting hazardous materials, but there are a few exceptions to this rule. These exceptions include when the quantities being transported are very small and when the material is either an infectious substance, other regulated material, ORM-D, or a non-bulk combustible liquid. When required, placards must be found in multiple locations on the vehicle, must state the hazard class, and follow all regulations found within CFR 49. Each hazard class has one or more placards, and they indicate just the hazard class or the class and the division. Placards must be securely attached to the transport vehicle and be at least 250 by 250 millimeters in size. Placards are always placed on each side and end, front and back of a container or vehicle. But what if more than one class of hazardous material is being transported in the same vehicle? So when this is the case, a dangerous placard may instead be placed on the outside of the vehicle, and each container inside is labeled with its correct hazard class. This placard can be used when there are non-bulk packages of less than 2,205 pounds of two or more classes in the same shipment. It cannot be used if the material is classified as class 1.1, 1 1.2, 1.3, 2.3, 4.3, 5.2, 6.1, or 7 if there are more than 2,205 pounds of hazardous material being transported, or if materials are being loaded from more than one facility. Instead, the individual placards for each substance must be secured to the outside of the vehicle. Supplemental placards may also be securely attached to the transport vehicle to increase awareness of the hazards of the substances contained inside. In addition to the hazard class, a four-digit ID number in a white square on the placard or as a completely separate orange label communicates the actual identity of the substance being transported. For example, ID number 1086 is used for vinyl chloride. The identity of the substance determines which emergency response guide to follow if an emergency occurs. Sometimes there will be two ID numbers. The second one is two to three digits long and indicates the hazard class and division. ID numbers are required on all bulk packages and must be visible on two sides of the vehicle containing 1,000 gallons or less or on all four sides for more than 1,000 gallons. They are also required for non-bulk packages of 4,000 kilograms or more. ID numbers are not required for class one or class seven substances for small quantities or combustibles. Consult with your supervisor to check for additional exceptions and rules that may apply to your particular situation. And 
now that we've discussed the importance of container labeling and the awareness it provides when transporting hazardous material, let's discuss how to correctly store some of the most common hazardous materials on site. OSHA regulations require that flammable liquids must be stored in approved containers or portable tanks. When storing more than 25 gallons of a flammable liquid inside, the cabinet must be either wooden or metal, hold its structure under standard fire tests, be labeled flammable, and be painted both inside and outside with fire retardant paint. In general, within each cabinet, no more than 60 gallons of flammable liquids should be stored. A minimum of one fire extinguisher nearby is required for every 60 gallons of liquid. When flammable liquids are stored outside, they may be found in containers or portable tanks. Each container cannot hold more than 60 gallons and must be labeled flammable, and no more than 1,100 gallons can be stored in the same area. Embankments or curbs must be used to divert a spillway from the building and there must be a large enough area for fire personnel to enter within 200 feet of the storage area. Flammable liquids may also be stored in portable tanks. These tanks are required to be 20 feet or more from the building and are required to have the necessary hazard symbols on them so everyone is aware of what the tanks contain. Liquefied petroleum gases, or LPGs, are fuel gases usually used for heating and cooking that contain one or more hydrocarbon gases like propane and butane. These gases are stored in liquid form under pressure in steel tanks or containers. These containers must be stored outside unless the building is used for any aspect of gas manufacturing. The size of the container or tank determines how far it must be from the building. For example, tanks containing up to 500 gallons must be 10 feet away, while tanks between 2,000 and 30,000 gallons need to be at least 50 feet away. Tanks containing LPGs are also required to be a minimum of 20 feet away from a tank containing another type of flammable liquid and cannot be stacked on top of one another. Anhydrous ammonia is used regularly in many industries, including those that process meat, poultry, fish, and dairy cold storage facilities, and wineries and breweries, as well as many others. When stored inside, the ammonia must be in a low-pressure, fire-resistant tank that is refrigerated and separated from work areas. If a system has 10,000 pounds or more, there are different rules and regulations. When stored outside, the storage tank is required to be coated in a paint that is reflective to help prevent corrosion and keep the temperature under control. Similar to LPGs, ammonia is flammable at higher concentrations in the air and should be stored away from other flammable liquids. If you are required to handle any of these or other hazardous materials, always wear proper PPE. Seek out additional training on material handling as needed, reference the SDS, and always ask your supervisor if you have questions. As we conclude our study on GHS container labeling, let's review some of the key concepts we've discussed. We explored the nine hazard classes and what types of hazardous materials are found within each one. We discussed the responsibilities of both the shipper and the carrier when hazardous materials are being transported. We discussed in detail the importance of placarding and ID numbers and the regulations for both. We discussed the storage requirements for common hazardous materials used in the general industry. We now have an understanding of the nine hazard classes, how to recognize labels for each class, and knowing the do's and don'ts of storing and transporting hazardous materials promotes a safe environment while at work and on the road. Remember to reference all SDS's emergency response guides and your supervisor as necessary for all required protocols and procedures. Seek out additional training to help stay up to date on all rules and regulations.